Welcome to Stories and Tea with Mrs. Straka, episode six. All right, so for today, we start our new book. And the book that we are reading now, drum roll please, Summer of the Monkeys by Wilson Ross. Uh, so he also wrote Where the Red Fern Grows, which fifth grade reads at the end of the year. So there we go. Let's get crack a -lack. And it does smell good. Mm. All right. Oh, and today's variety, by the way, a spice to try. Chapter one. Up until I was 14 years old, no boy on earth could have been happier. I didn't have a worry in the world. In fact, I was beginning to think it wasn't going to be half hard at all for me to grow up. But just when things were really looking good for me, something happened. I got mixed up with a bunch of monkeys and all of my happiness flew right out of the window. Those monkeys all but drove me out of my mind. If I had kept this monkey trouble to myself, I don't think it would have amounted to as much, but I got my grandpa mixed up in it. I felt pretty bad about that because grandpa was my pal and all he was trying to do was help me. I even coaxed Rowdy, my old blue tick hound, into helping me with this monkey trouble. He came out of the mess worse than grandpa and I did. Rowdy got so disgusted with me, monkeys, and everything in general, he wouldn't come out from under the house when I called him. It was in the late 1800s, the best I can remember. Anyhow, at the time we were living in a brand new country that had just opened up for settlement. The farm we lived on was called Cherokee Land because it was smack dab in the middle of the Cherokee Nation. It lay in a strip from the foothills of the Ozark Mountains to the banks of the Illinois River in northeastern Oklahoma. This was the last place in the world that anyone would expect to find a bunch of monkeys. I wasn't much bigger than a young possum when Mama and Papa settled on the land. But after I grew up a little, Papa told me all about it, how he and Mama hadn't been married very long and were sharecropping in Missouri. They were unhappy too, because in those days, being a sharecropper was just about as bad as being a hog thief. Everyone looked down on you. Mama and Papa were young and proud, and to have people look down on them was almost more than they could stand. They stayed to themselves, kept on sharecropping, and saving every dollar they could, hoping someday they could buy a farm of their own. Just when things were looking pretty good for Mama and Papa, something happened. Mama hauled off and had twins, my little sister Daisy and me. Papa said that I was born first, and he never saw a healthier boy. I was pink as a sunburnt huckleberry and as lively as a young squirrel in a corn crib. It was different with Daisy, though. Somewhere along the line, something went wrong, and she was born with her right leg all twisted up. The doctor said there wasn't much wrong with Daisy's old leg. It had something to do with muscles and leaders and things like that being all tangled up. He said there were doctors in Oklahoma City that could take a crippled leg and straighten it out as straight as a ramrod. This would cost quite a bit of money, though, and money was the one thing that Mama and Papa didn't have. Mama cried a lot in those days, and she prayed a lot, too, but nothing seemed to do any good. It was bad enough to be stuck there out on a sharecropper's farm, but to have a little daughter and a twisted leg and not be able to do anything for her hurt worst of all. Then one day, right out of clear blue sky, Mama got a letter from Grandpa. She read it, and her face turned as white as the bark on a sycamore tree. She sat right down on the dirt floor of our old sod house and started laughing and crying all at the same time. Papa said that after he had read the letter, it was all he could do from, to keep from bawling a little, too. Grandpa and Grandma were living down in Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. They owned one of those big old country stores that had everything in it. Grandpa wasn't only a storekeeper. He was a trader, too, and a good one. Papa always said that Grandpa was the only honest tra trader he ever knew that could trade a terrapin out of its shell. In his letter, Grandpa told Papa and Mama that he had done some trading with a Cherokee Indian for 60 acres of land and that it was theirs if they wanted it. It had never been farmed, and all they had to do was come down and make a farm out of it. They could pay him for it any way they wanted to. Well, the way Mama was carrying on, there wasn't but one thing Papa could do. The next morning before the roosters started crowing, he took what money they had saved and headed for town. He bought a team of big red Missouri mules and a covered wagon. Then he bought a turning plow and some seed corn and a milk cow. This took about all the money he had. It was way in the night when Papa got back home. Mama hadn't even gone to bed. She had everything they owned packed and was ready to go. They were both so eager to get away from that sharecropping farm that they started loading the wagon by moonlight. The last thing Papa did was to take two ba uh, was to make a two baby cradle. He took Mama's old wash tub and tied a short piece of rope to each handle. To give the cradle a little bit of bounce, he tied the ropes to two cultivator springs and hung the whole contraption inside the bows of the covered wagon. 
Mama thought the old washtub was the best baby cradle she had ever seen, and she filled it about half full with corn shucks and quilts, and then put Daisy and me down in it. After taking one last look at the sod house, Papa cracked the whip, and they left Missouri for Oklahoma Territory. When Papa told me that part of the story, he laughed and said, If anyone ever asks you how you got from Missouri to Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, you just tell them you rode a washtub every inch of the way. The day they reached Grandpa's store, Papa was just about all in and had his mind set on sleeping in one of Grandpa's, Grandma's feather beds. Mama wouldn't listen to that kind of talk at all, though. She had waited so long for a farm of her own, she was bound and determined to spend the night on her own land. Grandma tried to talk some sense into Mama. She told her the land was three miles down the river and certainly wasn't going to run away. They could stay all night with him, rest up, and go on the next day. But Mama puffed up like a setting hen in a hailstorm. Nothing Grandma or Grandpa said could change her mind, and she told Papa he could stay there if he wanted to. She would just take Daisy and me and go on by herself. Papa knew better than to open his mouth, because once Mama made up her mind like that, she wouldn't have budged an inch from a buzzing rattler. There wasn't but one thing he could do. He just climbed back in the wagon, unwrapped the check lines from the brake, and said, Get up to those old Missouri mules. It was in the twilight of evening when Mama and Papa reached the land of their dreams. They camped for the night in a grove of tall white sycamores right on the bank of the Illinois River. Papa said that as long as he lived, he would never forget that night. It seemed to him they were being welcomed by every living thing in those Cherokee bottoms. Whippoorwills were calling, and night hawks were crying as they dipped and darted through the starlit sky. Bullfrogs and hoot owls were jarring the ground with their deep voices. Even the little speckled tree frogs, the katydids, and the crickets were chipping in with their nickels worth of welcome music. A big grinning Ozark moon crawled up out of nowhere and seemed to say, Hi, neighbor. I've been looking for you. It gets kind of lonesome out here. Welcome to the land of the Cherokee. Papa said Mama was so taken in by all of that beauty, she seemed to be hypnotized. She just stood there in the moonlight with a warm little smile on her face, staring out over the river, her black eyes glowing like black haws in the morning dew. Finally, she gave a deep sigh, just as if she had dropped something heavy from her shoulders. Then, spreading out her arms wide, she said in a low voice, it's the work of the Lord. That's just what it is. Just think of all of this. Ours. Sixty acres of it. Papa said he was feeling so good, he felt he could have just walked right out on the waters of the river, just as Jesus did when he walked on the waters of the sea. Mama was a little m woman, barely tipping the scales at a hundred pounds, but what she lacked in height and weight, she made up in strength and spirit. Pulling her end of a cross-cut saw and swinging the heavy blade of a double-bitted axe, she helped Papa clear the land. Papa let Mama pick the spot for our log house. This wasn't an easy chore for her. She walked all over the 60 acres, looking and looking. Finally, she found the very spot she wanted and put her foot down. It was in the foothills, overlooking the river bottoms in the mouth of a little blue canyon. I grew up on that Cherokee farm and was just about as wild as the gray squirrels and sycamore trees and as free as the red-tailed hawks that weed their cries in those Ozark skies. I had a dandy pocket knife and a good dog, and that was about all a boy could hope for in those days. My little sister Daisy grew up too, but not like I did. It seemed as if that old leg of hers held her growing back. Each year it got worse and worse. The foot part kept getting twisting and twisting until finally she couldn't walk on it at all. That's when Papa made a crutch for her out of a red oak limb with a fork on one end. The way Daisy could zip around on that old homemade crutch was something to see. She could get around on it just about as well as I could on my two straight legs. It was always a mystery to me how my little sister could be so happy and so full of life with an old twisted leg like that. She was always laughing and singing and hopping around on that old crush, just as if she didn't have a worry in the world. Her one big delight was in getting me all riled up by poking fun at me. She never overlooked an opportunity, and it seemed that these opportunities came about every 15 minutes. Up on the hillside from our house, under a huge red oak tree, Daisy had a playhouse. From early spring until late fall, practically all of her time was spent there. I didn't like to mess around da Daisy's playhouse. Every time I went up there, I had a guilty feeling. Like, maybe I shouldn't be there. She had all kinds of girl stuff sitting around. Corn chuck dolls and mud pies and pretty bottles. She treasured every tin can that came into our home. And each one, she had some kind of wildflower peeking out. At one end of her playhouse, Daisy had built a little altar. She had made a cross by tying two grapevines together and was covering them, and covering them with tin foil. The face of Christ was there, too. Daisy had molded it from red clay. For the eyes, she had pressed blue shells from a hatched-out robin's nest into the soft clay. She had covered the crown with moss to resemble hair. When Mama discovered that the moss was actually growing in the soft clay, she told everyone in the hills about it. People came from miles around to see that miracle. I never saw anything like it myself. It was pretty around Daisy's playhouse. 
especially in the early spring when the dogwoods and redbuds and mountain flowers were blooming. Warm little breezes would whisper down into the garden, uh, down, <clears throat> down from green rugged hills, and the air would be so full of sweet smells it would make your nose tickle and burn. If you closed your eyes and filled your lungs full of that sweet-smelling stuff, your head would get as light as a hummingbird's feather and feel as if you were going to sail away by itself. Daisy was never alone in her playhouse. She had all kinds of little friends. Fat bunnies, red squirrels, and chipmunks would come right up to her and eat out of her hand. She wouldn't be in her playhouse five minutes until all kinds of wild birds would come winging in from the mountains. They would sit around in the bushes and sing so happy and loud that the mountains would ring with their birdie songs. Sometimes they would even light on her shoulders. I never could understand how my little sister made friends with birds and animals. I couldn't get within a mile of anything that hair that had hair or feathers on it. Daisy said it was because I was a boy and was catching things all the time. One morning in early spring, Papa came in from doing the chores with an empty milk bucket in his hand. He looked grouchy, and he didn't even say good morning to any of us. This was so unusual that right away, Mama knew something was wrong. From the cook stove where she was fixing our breakfast, Mama smiled and said, Knowing how desperate you are to get the planting done, I'd say it was going to rain. No, said Papa in a disgusted voice. It's not going to rain. Sally Gooden's gone again. Sally Gooden was our crazy old milk cow. Oh no, Mama exclaimed. Not again. I just can't understand that cow, said Papa, shaking his head. Just last week I put an extra rail on the pasture fence. It didn't do any good, though. She sailed over it as if it wasn't even there. Turning to me, Papa said, Jay Berry, you'll have to find her. That's all there is to it. It's wild onion time, and she gets a belly full of those things. Her milk won't be good for days. We can't do milk and butter. We can't do without milk and butter. When Papa asked me to do important things like that, it made me feel just about as big as those Ozark mountains around our log house. I puffed out my chest and said, I'll find Sally Good and Papa. She's probably down by the river bottoms. That's where I usually find her. It seemed that Papa and I never could hold a man-to-man -man conversation without Mama getting all worked up, especially if we were talking about my going down into the river bottoms. Mama frowned and said, That crazy old cow anyhow. Jay Barry, you be careful. I worry every time you go down on those bottoms. Worry? I said, big-eyed. Why, Mama? What do you have to worry for? I've been all over those bottoms. You know that. I know, Mama said. But I just worry the same. It's no place for a 14-year-old boy. Why, it's a regular jungle down there. You can't see 10 feet in any direction. And there's snakes and wild hogs and goodness knows what all. Oh, Mama, I said. You make it sound like I was going into the jungles of Africa or something. I've chased Sally Gooden out of those bottoms a thousand times, and nothing's happened yet. Besides, Rowdy's always with me, and he wouldn't let anything get within a mile of me. I didn't know it at the time, but about an hour later, I wasn't so sure that I wasn't in Africa, the deepest part of Africa. Sally Gooden was one thing we had around our farm that I hardly had... Oh my goodness, I need a sip of tea. I don't know what happened to that sentence. Hold on. Okay, now we're good. Sally Gooden was the one thing we had around our farm and that I thought was hardly worth putting up with. I always figured that she was the twin sister to a cow that had jumped over the moon. She could stand flat-footed and jump out of a well. It seemed as if I spent about half my time looking for her, and I figured my time was very valuable back then. We kept a bell in the jumping old thing, but that didn't do any good. Every time she heard me coming, she would get behind a bush and stand as still as a fence post. Sometimes I swore she held that bell in her mouth just to keep me from hearing it. <laughs> I don't think I ever could have found her if it hadn't been for Rowdy. He could sniff her out every time. Right after breakfast, I called Rowdy and we let out for the bottoms to look for the Lee's family milk supplier. It didn't take Rowdy long to sniff out Sally Gooden. She was down by an old slough that emptied into the river. It was cool and shady along the, be the banks of the slough and there was plenty of green grass. She was just standing there under a big sycamore, chewing her cud, and looking as innocent as the day she was born. I was just about to warm her up with a switch when, I, when an idea popped into my head. Looking at Rowdy, I said, It's a cinch. She's not going anywhere. Let's leave her alone for a while and do a little looking around. Rowdy's long, skinny tail started fanning the air. He whined and licked my hand. That was his way of saying, If you want me to do a little looking around, pal, it's all right with me. Now, if there was ever a place that needed looking into... It was the Cherokee Bottoms. A jillion, little game uh, a jillion little game trails twisted their way through the jungles of wild cane and mad masses of elder. Like the crawl of a black snake, they wound their way beneath the tall white sycamores, black gums, birches, and box elders. 
Every chance I had, I was down in those bottoms and doing a pretty good job of leaving my barefoot tracks in the dust of each trail and carving my initials in the smooth white bark of every sycamore tree. In the cool silence of those Cherokee bottoms, I could find all the wonders of a storybook world. Sometimes I was Daniel Boone. Then there would be spells of Davy Crockett or Kit Carson, the last of the Mohicans, and Tarzan. My favorite hero was Daniel Boone. With hawk feathers sticking in, uh, in the top of my old straw hat and my face painted with pokeberry juice till I'm sure I would have scared a hoot owl to death, I laid 10,000 Indians to rest in that sycamore heaven. Old Rowdy was always there, and he was always in the lead, ever alert for any danger that might lie in my way. He could send a diamondback, ra diamondback rattlesnake or a copperhead as long before I saw it, and he'd let me know that it was there. If there were any wild hogs around, he would scare the daylights out of them with his deep voice. Sometimes old Rowdy would hop up on a sycamore log, raise his head high in the air, and bawl. I always smiled when he did it, because I knew what he was doing. That was his way of telling every living thing in those Cherokee bottoms to look out, for a mighty hunter and blue tick hound were on the prowl. I loved every bone in old Rowdy's body, but what I liked about him most of all was the way he could understand me. Sometimes I figured he could understand me better than grown folks could. At least, he would never say no to anything I suggested. We were following a little game trail deep in the heart of the bottoms when all at once Rowdy stopped and raised his head in the air. I could tell by Rowdy's actions that he had scented something, but was having trouble locating it. Just then, a warm summer breeze whispered down from the hills and fanned its way through the tall timbered bottoms. That was all it took for the sniffing of old Rowdy to zero in. What is it, boy? I whispered. Rowdy looked at me and whined. Go get it, I said in a low voice. With no more noise than the shadow of a winging hawk, Rowdy turned and padded from sight in the folding green. Standing as still as the sycamores around me, I waited and listened. And I didn't have to wait long. The bell-like tones of my old dog's voice jarred the silence around me. He was bawling treed, and his deep voice was telling me, and the whole wide world, that he had something stuck up in a tree. That's what treed means, by the way. To let Rowdy know that I was coming, I reared back and whooped as loud as I could. Woo! Ducking my head and running as fast as my legs could carry me, I started boring my way through the underbrush. Rowdy had something treed in a huge burr oak that was a solid mass of green. As I walked around the big tree, I peered into the dark foliage. I said, what is it, boy? A squirrel? Not being able to see anything, I backed off to one side, picked up a stick, and threw it into the branches. From a shadow close to the trunk of the big tree, something moved out onto a limb. I couldn't see what it was until it walked into an opening. At first, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was a monkey. An honest-to-goodness live monkey. I was so surprised, I couldn't say or move. Oh my goodness, I couldn't move or say a word. All I could do was stand there with my eyes bugged out and stare at it. The monkey was staring at me, too. He just sat there on a limb, boring holes through me with his bright little eyes. Then he opened his mouth like he was going to scream his head off, but he didn't make a sound. All he did was show me a mouthful of needle-sharp teeth. He looked so cute and funny, I couldn't help laughing out loud. Rowdy had seen the monkey, too, and was having a hound dog fit over it. He was trying his best to run right up the trunk of the burr oak tree, and all the time his deep voice was telling the monkey that it was the end of the road. I didn't know whether the monkey got mad or scared. Anyhow, he reared up on his hind legs and let out a cry. All around me, the bottoms came to life with noises I had never heard before. Grunts and squeals, barks and cries, and everything else. I didn't get scared until I remembered that about the only place you could find wild monkeys was in the jungles somewhere. The very thought of jungles brought up visions of all kinds of man-eating things like lions and tigers and gorillas, and then I got really scared. My old heart started turning somersaults, and something that felt like a thousand-legged centipede jiggled its way up my spine. Let's get out of here, I yelled at Rowdy, and tore down the game trail like a scalded cat. Any second, I expected something to jump out of the bushes and eat me up. Old Rowdy could usually outrun me, but it was all he could do to stay with me this time. I came tearing out of the bottoms into one of our fields. At the far end, I saw Papa hitching one of our mules to a corn planter. I headed for him, kicking up dust. About five feet from Papa, I threw on the brakes and said in a loud voice, Papa, Rowdy, treat a monkey! Papa just stood there for a second, looking at me. Then he smiled and said, Jay Barry, when a boy's growing up, it's all right for him to see things. I did myself. But you're getting to be a pretty big boy now, and I think it's time you quit seeing things. Rowdy probably just treated a squirrel. No, he didn't, Papa, I almost shouted. It wasn't a squirrel. It was a monkey. An honest-to-goodness live monkey. I saw it plain as day. Looking at me kind of hard, Papa said, Now hold on just a minute. 
I can't remember you've ever seen a monkey before. I ain't never seen a live one, Papa, I said, but I have seen pictures of them. You remember that little thing Grandma gave me a long time ago? That thing that had three monkeys on it who couldn't see anything or hear anything or say anything? Well, that thing that rowdy tree looked just like they did. I'm sure it was a monkey, all right. I guess Papas have a way of knowing when boys are telling the truth. Papa frowned and looked off toward the bottoms. Maybe you did see a monkey, he said, but it's sure hard to believe. I never heard of any monkeys being around here. Well, there's one out here now, Papa, I said. He's right down there in the bottom, sitting on a bur oak limb, big as you please. Papa didn't even act as if he heard what he said, what I said. He just stood there with a thoughtful look on his face, staring off toward the bottoms. After what seemed like an hour to me, he chuckled and said, <laughs> Why, that explains it. Sure, that's it. Has to be. What explains what, Papa? I asked. That monkey, Papa said, chuckling. You know all those rich people that come up here in the summer to fish on the river? Well, the way I see it, one of them had a pet monkey, and it got away from him. I was just about to go along with what Papa had said, when I remembered all those strange noises I heard. Papa, I said, I believe there was something else down there. I heard a lot of different noises. Do you reckon there could have been more monkeys? Ah, said Papa, turning to pour seed according to the hopper of the planter. You probably just got scared and thought you heard something. Besides, if there were monkeys all over the country... Oh, my country. Country. I couldn't do anything about it. I have to get this corn planted, Jayberry. We can't do without monkeys. We can do without monkeys, but we can't do without bread corn. I was aching all over to have Papa go with me to look for the monkey, but I knew it wouldn't do any good to ask him. He thought so much of that little farm of ours, he wouldn't stop working to watch a herd of elephants march down the road. Just as Papa was putting the check lines over his shoulders, he said, Oh, by the way, did you find Sally Gooden? Yes, sir, I said. She's down by the old slough. I guess when I saw the monkey, I got so excited I forgot all about her. I'm sorry. I'll go get her. Papa smiled and said, No, now. Now that I know where she is, I'll look after her. Your mother needs some things from the store, and I think she has a little job she wants you to do. Yes, sir, I said, and started to trot for the house. I didn't have the least bit of trouble getting Mama to believe in my monkey. She already believed that the bottoms were full of things that could gobble me up. Monkey, Mama said, looking all worried. I don't doubt it. There could be anything down in those bottoms. Monkey? Why, I never heard of anything like it. I don't know. I just don't know. I saw right away that if I didn't say something to ease Mama's mind, she was liable to start laying down the law about me going into the bottoms. Ah, now, Mama, I said. I can't see why you have to get all worked up like that just because I saw a monkey. Papa said it was probably a pet that belonged to a fisherman and it got away from him. Jay Barry, Mama said. Your father doesn't know everything, but I hope he's right. I certainly do. All we need around here now are some lions and tigers and a few more wild things. We may as well be living in the jungles. I wish more people would move into the country. It's not safe the way it is. It's too wild and untamed. To get Mama's mind off these wild things, I changed the conversation. Uh, Papa said you wanted me to go to the store, I said. I do, Mama said. But I expect I'd better get a piece of paper and write down all the things I want. With that monkey running around in your head, you'd probably forget half the things I need. I waited while Mama got a pencil and paper and made a list of the things she needed. Cramming the list down one of my overall pockets, she said, Now you hurry back from the store. I intend to set some hens today and I need you to put fresh straw in the nest. I will, Mama, I said, and bolted for the door. Okay, that is where we stop for today. Thank you all for joining me and I'll see you next time.